this week's going to be full of analysis for you. You have three lectures and you have a tutorial. Uh, so just to remind who was not here last class, so this week we're going to have three lectures, okay? So let's continue. This is our functional analysis 2019. And this is lecture number nine. Okay. So today we start talking about weak topologies. All right. Uh, so just a reminder. This week we have class, so the lecture 10 will be on Thursday at 2 p.m. Okay, and the lecture 11 will be on Friday, the normal time, 4 p.m. So this week we have this extra class on Thursday to compensate for, you will have one week of break, you have your spring break on March. 11 to 15. Okay. Okay. So I hope you all are all recovered from the pizza last night and you're ready to continue. How is the course so far? So last week we have seen like these basic theorems, have Banach theorem, open mapping theorem, Banach Steinhaus theorem, the closed graph theorem. These are fundamental tools in in functional analysis, this essentially covers chapters one and two of the book of Brazis. But please take a look at the book. Don't just stay with what we have seen here in class. Go and take a look at Brazis' book, read the whole chapter, solve some exercises from the book. Uh, read another book that if you want to. They have different examples, different proofs. You can take a look too. So far, I have been assigning homework mainly from other sources, but I may get some of the problems from Brazil from now on, which are very good problems as well. Uh, I hope you guys are having fun so far. But I see that you are a bit tired. Okay. Let's uh, try to make it more friendly today. Uh, so any questions from what we have seen? these past couple of weeks? Or is everything more or less on track? Because now we're going to enter in a very, very important topic, uh, which essentially we'll be talking about this for the, maybe this week for the next three lectures, two or three lectures. This corresponds to chapter three of Brazil's book, okay? And we will be discussing these concepts of weak topologies, the weak and weak star topology, and why do we do that? All right, so... You have taken a class of topology here in this, in the diploma program, now, can you tell me how it was? I mean, what sort of things did you did in the class, if you, if you remember? Can someone explain to me in a nutshell what you have seen in topology? Maybe some of the main theorems that you liked. I'm not, I'm not asking you to give, say, uh, 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 your feedback on the class, but just uh, some, some of the main theorems that you have talked a little bit about Tikhonov's theorem, did you prove this theorem in the class? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. mentioned. It was mentioned in the class, so we discussed essentially... Well, we spoke about um, uh, horizontal Okay, you stopped on this. This was what, 10, 10 classes or 15 classes for topology? Yeah, 10 classes. 10 classes, so you discuss, start first discussing what the uh, open sets, closed sets, compactness, theorems, and so on. Okay. Uh, you see, it's a bit, uh, it's 
Some people, when they first uh, studied topology in a metric space, like topology on R, usually when you have a norm, you can define the open balls, and those are the open sets, and you create a topology out of that. But a topological space, as you might have seen in this topology class, has it's not necessarily attached to a norm or a, or a metric. Okay? So a topological space doesn't have to be a normal space or a metric space. It's essentially a topological space. So it can be any set. So this is your space. And a topology is just a choice that you make of the open sets, which are subsets of your space. So you just tell me what are going to be these open sets, and they have to uh, satisfy some properties, right? So let's just start recalling this. So, so if I have, say, x a space, and t, say, a topology, right? So x is a space, and t is going to be my topology. Topology will be, for me, just a collection of subsets, okay? Collections of subsets of x, right? And this collection must satisfy a few rules. So first rule is that the empty set and the whole set have to belong to this topology. Second is that, so this, this, this is called collection of subsets, which you are going to baptize as open sets. Okay, So we baptize these sets that you chose as open sets. So the empty set and the full space are open. What else? So, uh, so you kind of mimic what you have on the, on the real line, right? So, uh, a finite intersection, so if you have, say, AIs, so finite intersection, but with finite intersection of AIs has to belong to the topology if the AIs belong to the topology. Okay, so finite intersections and any sort of union, say arbitrary. Union of AIs. T of this, this I belong to a certain subset of this, this I is going to. Okay. okay. So I'm emphasizing that finite intersection, so you have a finite intersection of open sets is open, and an arbitrary union of open sets is open. My T is starting to be, look like a, a J. So these are the, the, the rules that you, make, that you have to, to, to verify to create your topology. So you could certainly get your set X as being the four suits of a deck of cards. So let's say hearts. You have spades, which I don't know how to draw here very well. And you have uh, clubs, whatever it is, and you have diamonds. Okay, and you just choose a few sets to be open, and uh, you generate the topology for that. So you may choose as open sets here. It would be okay if you chose as open just the empty set, the X, and say perhaps this guy. Is this a topology? This is a topology, right? Or, or, you could choose as open set the 2 to the 4 subsets, all the 16 subsets of this thing. This is also a topology where everybody is open. Okay? Now, uh, you will see that for a topology to have a lot of open sets, it's not something very significant. It doesn't serve too much purpose because once you have a set, a space with a topology, you can talk about continuous maps, okay? 
So all you need to talk about continuous maps is a topology. So continuity is, uh, is uh, something that depends just on the topology. So if you have a function f from a space x with a certain topology t, to another topological space y, okay, so let me put f, x and y. So this is uh, continuous if the pre-image, so f minus 1 of a is open in x for all a open in y. So the pre-image of open sets is open. This is the definition of a function being continuous. Oh, Emmanuel, what I learned on the first class of calculus that a function is continuous, if I, if I get close to the point, then the function gets closer. That's okay. When you are in the metric space, this is equivalent. If the topology is the topology from the metric. But if you are just in topological space, this is the definition of continuity. So the pre-image of open sets is open. Okay. okay. This is called, you, you call a function continuous. Uh, good. So, So I want to raise your attention to this fact. So we'll be defining different types of topologies on the same set because to, to be able to speak on, on, on some maps being or not continuous, this is one. And one of the awesome theorems in analysis or one of the awesome things in analysis that you have is the ability to find converging, convergent sequences, right? So whenever you have, say, you learn the topology, also this notion of compactness. Right? Oh, first I learned about compactness, and uh, when I first learned about compactness was when I was doing what, studying R and RD, and I learned that a subset is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. This is okay for RD. But the definition of compactness as the definition of continuity is something that is just topological. Right? If you're in a topological space, so, so a set, say, A contained in X is compact if every covering of A by open sets admits a finite sub-covering. So every time that you cover your set A by open sets, infinitely countably, even not countably, you can always extract a finite sub-covering. This is what compact means. Of course, in the when, when you're working with metric spaces, this is equivalent of saying that for any bounded sequence of points. Uh, no, sorry, what I want to say, no, it's not this. Uh, you can find as yes, a convergence of sequence. Yeah. So let us first. Uh, I want to first. Recall the following fact that I assigned to you as the homework. So let's start the class today with the following proposition. Proposition one. Let's discuss this. So let E be a normed a Banach space if you want. Let E be a Banach space. Uh, or even or just or simply a normal vector space if you want. Such that of with 
to infinite dimension. So let's take an infinite dimensional normal vector space. Then take the unit ball. Then the unit ball, let's call it BE, a closed unit ball. So these are the elements in E such that the norm is less than or equal to 1. This set is not compact. So again, uh, when I mean compact, I'm already saying what is the topology. I have to specify what is the topology in the space. Right? So whenever I don't say anything, and whenever I have a norm, I am talking about the usual topology given by this norm. Okay? So the topology node, in this case, topology is called the strong topology. This is the top, the usual, the usual one given by the norm. Okay. Now, by open balls, open balls with respect to this norm form a basis of this topology. These are the basic open sets, and a set is open if and only if around each point I can put a little ball of the norm inside the set. This is this this is strong topology. Now, this is the very, one of the most fundamental things that you will learn in this class of functional analysis. This was a homework that I assigned to you, but I want to go over a little bit in detail. You might have done this problem, but we'll do it again. Uh, when you are in a finite dimensional setting, the unit ball is compact. When you are in an infinite dimensional setting, the unit ball is not compact in the strong topology at all. Okay? So, please. Please, I beg you, get out of this class knowing this result, okay? So if you're ever asked in the street, say if you are in a Hebrew space of infinite dimension, the ball is compact, and you say yes, please don't tell this guy that you do functional analysis with me, okay? <laughs> this is one thing that you have to go out of this class and learn. Okay? So the unit ball is not compact anymore. How strange, you know, this is, as you said in the, in the, in the beginning, this is a bounded set and a closed set. So what we have learned in Rn doesn't hold anymore. So in Rn you have this equivalence. Being compact is the same as being closed and bounded. This even has a name, it's heine borel theorem, right? But again, the definition of compactness is this one. And uh, the, the proof that it's equivalent to being bounded and closed in Rn is a consequence. But uh, being closed and bounded is not the definition of compactness, otherwise this would be compact. Okay, so this is the definition. If you are in a Hausdorff uh, setting, if you are in a Hausdorff topological space, this is equivalent to saying that every sequence in this space has a convergent subsequence. Okay, so every sequence in this space has a convergence of sequence. Right. Can this we take an infinite basis and normalize it? Okay, so you're, you're going over the proposition one. Yeah. Yes, so, so the proof of proposition one, I'm just saying that the definition of compactness of, of uh, every covering by open sets has a finite subcovering is equivalent to saying that every sequence in this uh, set A has a convergence subsequence to a point. In A. Okay. Uh, all right, so what do I want to do? So let's go over the proof of this fact. Yes, so the proof is, is very intuitive and geometric. Right? Like you said, it's like uh, trying to get the basis somehow of guys who are kind of far apart from each other. So you see, so in this, in this ball, what you want to do is exploit the fact that you are in an infinite dimensional setting to somehow choose a lot of orthogonal vectors. So, so imagine that uh, if you were in R2, you could choose two orthogonal vectors in the unit ball. If you were in R3, you could choose three. If you were in R4, you could choose four. So if you are in infinite dimensional, in theory, you could choose infinitely dimensionally many orthogonal vectors, so they have all norm one, and they're apart from each other by, say, square root of two. Mm -hmm. if, so. We don't have orthogonal. 
morally. I'm just thinking morally, right? So now let's uh, let's make this work. We don't have orthogonality here. We don't have uh, an inner product, but let's make this work. So so what you want is like you first. So we're going to choose. We're going to choose. So how 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 will this proof go? So we will exhibit. Uh, a sequence of vectors xn, let's say xn from n equals 1 to infinity, an infinite sequence, all the xn will have norm 1, so they will be in this unit ball, and the difference, the distance between any two of them will always be bigger than a half. I will exhibit a bunch of elements all normalized to be one, and the difference between two of them is going to be bigger or equal than a half. Wow. Of course, this shows, if I can do this, right, so this shows that this unit ball is not compact. particular sequence Xn has no convergent subsequence. I think just we need to add the condition that n is not equal to n. Yeah. Just that. Right? So if you have a sequence like this that all, every pair of guys is separated, if you take this sequence it will have no convergent subsequence. Because if it had a subsequence that converged to some point y, so at some point xn would be close to y, xn would be close to y as well, so xn and xn would be close to each other, violating this thing. Okay. So this is the idea. And we do this in a in a in a in a algorithmic way. So the step one of course, is to choose your x1. You just choose any vector x1 with norm 1. All right? So the inductive step, so let's put step 2, uh, assume, assume uh, you have chosen x1, x2, xn satisfying this property. Assume you have chosen the first n guys. So you let, uh, say, f n be the space, the vector space generated by these guys. Okay? You let f n be the span that's generated by these guys the vector space generated by this, this first n vectors. Let me call this fn. Uh, so what can I do? So here's your fn. It's a finite dimensional subspace. So as a finite dimensional subspace, it's a closed subspace. Okay, so this is a finite dimensional subspace of E. Being finite dimensional, it's closed. Okay, so Fn is a closed subspace of E. Okay, since the dimensional, let's say the dimension of Fn is, I'm going to choose. I will add at each step a guy which is linearly independent with the other guys. Uh, okay. So it's a closed subspace, but since my space is infinitely infinite dimensional, so Fn is not the whole thing. There is a guy outside. Okay? So since so there exists. Okay. Yn, there exists Yn, Yn plus 1, let's do it, Yn plus 1, certain point, which lies in E and not in F. All right, 
So you have a little guy here, a guy that I call Y. Well, let's, let's drop the index for now. It's just, there exists a Y which lies outside. Okay? Now, this Y lies outside. So, huh, the distance, what can you tell me about the distance from Y to this subspace Fn? So this distance is by definition the infinity of y minus z with z belonging to fn, okay? This is the distance of a point to a set, is the infinity of the distances. This distance here is strictly bigger than zero. Why? Well, let's see why. If this distance were zero, this means that there will be a sequence of z's getting as close as possible to y. There will be a sequence of z getting as close as possible to y. So in particular, they would be inside the unit ball around y, intersection your set. So they would be inside a bounded subset of your set. Since your set is finite dimensional, a bounded subset has a convergent subsequence of z's. And since it's closed, the limiting point y would have to belong to the set. Okay, so this is the full explanation of things. So this y, the distance of y to fn, is bigger equal than zero. Call this distance, say, d. d is bigger than zero. Now you make for any say, theta between 0 and 1, strictly between 0 and 1, we can find a point. Remember, guys, this distance, it may not be realized, OK? It's not that there exists a point that is the closest point. This is the intuition when you are in a finite dimensional setting. But when you are in infinite dimension, these things may not happen. So you have to be careful with these arguments, right? So this distance is the, is the infimum of the distances. So for any theta between 0 and 1, you can find a point C belonging to Fn such that, uh, let's say, y minus z is certainly less than or equal than d, but bigger or equal than d over theta. Uh, that's the other way around, right? This is bigger equal than d, even less than or equal than d over theta. I can do that, right? Okay. So, suppose you found a point here which is relatively close. This is your z. Now I want to normalize things. What I want to do is, this is my coordinate axis here. What I want to do is to say, bring this guy y, say to the, to what would be the orthogonal direction here. So what I want to do is now consider the point x n plus one as just being y minus this z divided by the norm of y minus this c. Okay. Obviously, by construction, the norm of this guy is 1. All right? And so I'm taking a vector and divided by its norm. So this has norm 1. And for any z z tilde in your subspace Fn, we have, now let's compute the distance, say xn minus 1 minus z tilde is equal to y minus z over y minus z 
minus z tilde. I can multiply here up and down by this number. Now I point out to you that this vector here in purple belongs to Fn. Okay? This vector here in purple belongs to Fn. So this implies that the distance from x and minus 1 to z tilde is the distance from y to a point in that subspace. And this is bigger or equal than d y minus anybody is bigger or equal than d divided by y minus z. Okay? But y minus z on itself was less than or equal than d over theta. So this is bigger or equal than d multiplied by theta over d. I'm just using that y minus z is less than d over theta in the second. Which now we cancel the d and this is bigger or equal than that. For any CT. Okay. So you just choose that that to be one half. And your proof is complete. So just choose your theta to be one half, and you will find that this point here, the distance to any other point in the previous subspace is bigger or equal than a half. And then you keep doing this process. In particular, since the distance to any point in the subspace is bigger or equal than a half, the distance to the other end points is bigger or equal than a half. So this is a simple proof that the unit ball is not compact. We didn't use that it was a Banach space, we just used here the norm, so let's just call it normal vector space, infinite dimensional normal vector space, the unit ball is not compact. Message of today's class, okay? Good. You should be able to answer this question even if you're drunk. Good. Uh, why do you need uh, No, we don't need Banach, that's what I'm saying. No, I, I, for example, if Fn, why Fn is closer for dimension, it's n, of course, but it's, uh, it, we need, I think we need Banach for this, because for in Rn, it's, it's isomorphic to Rn, but uh, not the usual, uh, our usual uh, norm is, I mean. Uh, let's if see. Banach, if, if Banach, we can see this, this is closer. Let's see, okay, so, okay, so, so, I guess. The subspace is closer if Banach, we can see. Say that again. Say that again, Kaki boy. What's uh, what's your? Uh, uh, I, I don't I don't want to fight because of this. Okay, so it's not a big deal. So if we need Banach space, we put Banach space. Let's just see if we need it. Uh, so if I am just in a norm vector space. If, if say my space is not one, like if I'm in a norm vector space, I can talk about the norm, the distance, the topology. Yes. Okay. Uh, you're saying that this this space will not be closed in will not yeah, be yeah. will not maybe be closed. Not. In, maybe it's not closed in E. That's what you're claiming. Yeah, it's not closed in E because in R C V if line is not closed like. Uh, we can construct, uh, we can choose uh, as a norm, it's not standard norm, just one way then or something like that, it's not closed. But in R, in a finite dimensional space, any two norms are equivalent. There's just one norm. This is one of the results that you might have learned in linear algebra, right? So in a finite dimensional space, any two norms are equivalent.
let's 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 take let's give this fact. So if you are in a finite dimensional space, any two norms that you put in this finite dimensional space are equivalent. There is a constant above and below. Uh, I think the way let's give this let's assume this fact, and then this will be a closed subspace in E. Okay, because because the norm of E obviously induces a norm in F n, and if you take a convergent sequence in F n to somebody. This will be a bounded sequence in Fn. It will converge to a guy in Fn. I, I think it depends on the field. The, the, the field over which the vector space is defined. This 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 what needs to be complete. Because if we have a sequence of Yes, Fn, absolutely. Okay. Everything for me is, is, is these are vector spaces over R, okay? Yes, so R is complete and yes. that's what we need. Because yes. in the coefficients of the vectors will form a Cauchy sequence. Yes. That's how we construct it. Alright. Again, we won't find it because of this. Most of the examples that you would do were kind of with bounding space. But that's fine. Uh, let's see. But keep this construction in mind. Unit balls not compact. Uh, good. Let me erase it. And usually, what is the enemy for the unit ball not being compact? The usual enemy is that you have two, so remember, sets compact, whenever you have a covering by open sets, you can find a finite subcovering. Now, the usual enemy is that you have lots of open sets. So if you have a lot of open sets, then you may do very strange coverings of your set, which end up, ends up not being compact. Okay, so having a lot of open sets is bad for establishing compactness of some sets. Right? Sometimes when you have less open sets, so you have less freedom to do your covering, therefore you generally can find a subcovering. So one of the reasons for us to define weaker topologies, as the name suggests, weak topologies, the topologies will have less open sets. Okay? So in some cases we'll be able to get back some of the compactness results that we had before, which are very important for some applications in analysis and PDs, to be able to have compact sets, to be able to have, whenever you have a bounded sequence, be able to extract the subsequence. This is usually one of the mechanisms that you use to produce a solutions of, of you know, soft PDEs, of fixed point theorems, some things like this. Okay? So, rule number two, having compact sets in your topology is very, very nice. Good. Okay? So we have, so the, one of the main pictures of this, is to actually keep the balance between, okay, I don't want a topology to have very few open sets, to be very trivial, because I, I want still, I want to be able to make, make sense of some continuous maps, I want to have some continuous maps, so I don't want the topology to be completely trivial, but on the other hand, I don't want the topology to be completely full and packed with sets in order to not have some compact sets that, that I would like to have, okay? So you want your topology to have some continuous maps, but at the same time to have not too many open sets, so we have some compactness results. Uh, good. So after having settled this, and after knowing that we may have that the unit ball is not compact in an infinite dimensional setting, I want to discuss with you maybe the second point that I want to make today, so my point number two, is how do we construct, like constructing the smaller topology okay, that contains certain subsets. Alright? So what I want to give you is 
a space x. So I give you a space x. And I give you some sets. I give, say, sets u lambda, where lambda belongs to a certain collection of indexes. Okay? So this is your set. These are subsets. And I ask you, what is the smallest topology that contains these subsets? You, you, you lambda this. It's a bad choice because I'm going to use union, so let's just call A lambda. Okay. So the question is, what is the smallest topology that contains all the A double? Yeah, but how do I construct it, right? The sections are the same. Exactly. So you have to you have to abide by the rules that define a topology. So if you were in this set one, two, three, four, and I wanted the if this is x, and I wanted this, this, and I wanted one, and I wanted one, two, three to be open, I want these guys to be open, and I say I want the two, three to be open as well. What else do I do? Do I want this, say, three, four? Suppose I want these guys to be open sets. Right? These do not form a topology. I have to make sure that all of the all of the finite intersections and if and arbitrary unions are. So if these are my original sets, I have to take finite intersections between any two of them, and they have to be part of the topology as well. Right? So for example, the the set three. Just the number three has to be one of the open sets because it's the intersection of this and this. So it is essentially by this process that you generate the smallest topology that contains a certain given number of subsets. Okay. So the process is relatively simple. So first you do the finite intersections. So if these are all going to be part of my topology, then the set, which we call, say, phi is going to be finite intersections of a lambdas, any sort of finite intersection of a lambdas has to be part of the topology, right? So, okay, so you are uh, including a few more sets, and then any sort of arbitrary unions of sets like this has to be part of the topology as well. So let's call this T to be arbitrary unions of, say, omegas, and uh, omegas being sets that we define in phi here. Arbitrary units of the set before. Okay? In other words, your T is just arbitrary units of finite intersections of elements. So all of these sets have to belong to your topology, right? So whatever smallest is has to contain all of these sets. Right? Of course, you were right. You, you, you were declaring what's the definition of the smallest topology, right? So topology is just a collection of sets. Uh, so the smallest would be the intersection of all of these collections of sets, right? So this is the smallest topology. But I'm going the other way around. I'm going, instead of going up, down, I'm going, I'm trying to construct because these are the sets that I have. So the topology will have to contain these guys, and it will have to contain these guys. Okay? So essentially, we have to contain arbitrary unions of finite intersections of these eight lambdas. Okay? So the, the smallest topology will have to contain these guys. I claim to you that this is enough. So the claim is that this T is a topology. I claim that this T is a topology. You don't need more than that.
portfolio to US exercise. But it's not hard to see. Let's just think about it. So now I'm giving this sets of this form T. What I want to do is to show that any sort of finite intersections of guys in T are in T and arbitrary unions of guys in T are in T. So let's just take, say, arbitrary unions, just easy, it's just by definition, right? So if you get arbitrary unions of sets like this, you just put together the two unions, which are two arbitrary unions, and get an arbitrary union of, of finite uh, intersections. Do you require at the beginning that the union of all the set subsets A lambda be X? Yeah, that's all. Because I think that the way you can, because, because, for example, if I take one lambda, which is the NT set, yeah. we need at to the put the condition that the, the union is X. At the end, T. So, okay, so let's just uh, think. Uh, or we can put it another way. If we have these sets, we can define a topology on zero union. Or we can define the intersection. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Let's just, uh, I, 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 that condition that the open set and the whole set, the condition number one that I wrote here when I defined the topology, you can even withdraw that if you want. Then you would be defining a topology on the union of the, of the A lambdas if you want. Okay? So it's like uh, when you are in RD, you can talk about the induced topology if you are in a subspace, right? So if you are in R2, but if you are on the on the line R, you just take uh, yeah. So this would be defining a topology in the union of the all A lambdas, if you want. Okay. So just think about the definition of topology that I wrote there, and let's just forget for a little bit that the empty and the and the full set will be open sets. This will be obviously true in most of the cases that we will work, but uh, let's forget about that. Uh, So yeah, so in essence, this is the smallest topology that contains all the lambda. This is essentially on X intersection, the union of all A lambdas. That's it. This, you can consider this as being your space, if you want. Not, if X is such a, a, a bigger space, right? So it's like, yeah. So if, say, if you are in R2, and I give you just sets in this line, and you're allowed to do intersections and things, of course, you'll never leave this line, right? So you'll be constructing a topology just on this line and not on the whole thing. But uh, again, philosophical points, not completely important for our discussion. Uh, yeah, so when I say that it's, this is more topology, that this set here, the set T that we made here is is closed under these operations, arbitrary unions and finite intersection. Uh, again, to see why this, why if I can get a bunch of sets like this, why I can just put an arbitrary union of these sets, I just put the two unions together, and it's an arbitrary union of finite intersection. That's okay. Now, when you have a, a finite intersection of sets like this, So you have to somehow move this guy inside and make it a union of all the possible combinations of, uh, of intersections. But the finite intersection with the finite intersection will still be a finite intersection. You play a little bit this game, so just set the theory, and you find out that this works. Uh, I note that if you reverse the process, if you say, OK, I didn't like to start by finite intersections. I would like to start by taking arbitrary unions and then taking finite intersections. This would not stabilize the process. This, if you did it in the different order, this would not create, of course, the topology would have to contain all these sets, but those would not be enough to generate the topology. Uh, only if you did the union again, then you would be stabilizing the thing. Okay. Is that somehow clear? Okay, so this is, this generates a, a, a a topology. Let's see. In fact, sometimes I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going, I'm going to refer as a basis of a topology.
Okay? So I will say that the circle set B a certain collection of subsets let's call it B is a basis of the topology so T if if for any say V element of the topology so if any say open set V and any x0 belonging to V so if I have a set V an open set and a point x0 inside the set V there always exists, there exists a W, an element of this basis, okay, such that X0 belongs to W and W is inside. So we say basic open set here that uh, contains X0 and that is inside V. Okay, so for every open set, Every point inside there is some guy that does this. So that's pretty much like saying, in this sense, we say that uh, B, uh, sometimes B, we say that B generates the topology. This is pretty much like the open sets in the Euclidean space. They are a basis for the topology. That the basic open sets. So every open set, every point contains a basic open set here. Uh, and of course, if you try to generate the smallest topology that contains this B, you will get back to this T. Let's see. So this T, say, is a topology that contains B. Now, if I start to generate the topology that uh, that uh, has this B. So I, 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 let me show that every every open set in this topology T is in this construction here. If I just started with this set B, so for this I just take any open set V, and then I take any point here. For any point, there is a basic open set. So I just take all the basic open sets. So this set V. It's just going to be the union of these sets W, which W is obviously attached to X0, for all the X0s in V. So every set in this topology would be in the topology generated by B in this set. So actually the topology generated by B will be actually T. So T is the topology. It contains the topology generated by B. Uh, So, uh, so let's see. We just prove that T contains the topology generated by B. Uh, if T were not the topology generated by B, what would happen? Contradiction to minimality. Contradiction to minimality uh, of smallest, smallest topology. So why is that a contradiction? I can go. I don't see. So if T, uh, my question is certainly this this T contains the smallest topology generated by B. Okay? My question is, can it be bigger? Can it be a bigger topology? But uh, he said that already this is smallest. No. No, because oh. it can't be because if this uh, is bigger, is it we get this open set which doesn't uh, in T, and because this is a basis of T by definition, there exists uh, a basis one which uh, which lies in this. So essentially, yes. So, so there can be no open set in T that is not generated by B because we will do this construction and then we will prove that it's generated by B if such conditions are met, right? So yeah. Okay. So in this sense, is that clear? So this this uh, this uh, this B generates the topology T in this sense that we define here. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, let's see what I want. So, so 
So, Sense before note that these guys they form a basis in this definition here. Mm -hmm. These guys form a basis. Okay, I'm not saying that these guys form a basis, I'm saying that these guys form. In fact, if I give you any open set in my topology T, so these guys are so this is a basis of T. This, this field, the basis of T. If I give you any guy in T, any guy in T, so it's a union of arbitrary guys like this. So if I give you a point x0 in this open set, obviously x0 has to belong to someone, and this is one of the basic sets. Okay. So essentially, almost by definition, these guys form a basis of the point. Good. Okay. You see that our Discussions become a little bit abstract, but are we okay so far? Okay, so we've seen that the unit ball is not compact. We now have discussed how can we make the smallest topology that we can, provide that I'm defining that some subsets are 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 open. Good. Now let me erase it. So now let's, let's try to define uh, what is the weak topology on a Banach space. So I'm going to see, okay, so weak topology. Uh, so E, now let's just fi fix E to be a Banach space for now. Okay, and we have already talked about it's dual, right? So it's dual is the space that we call E star. It's just the vector space, the Banach space of the continuous linear functions. So it's F and E to R, which are linear and continuous. So you see, I already put here the word continuous. So when I mean continuous, I mean continuous in the strong topology. So this is my Banach space. It already comes with the topology. Okay, so E with the topology generated by, with the usual topology, the usual topology in E, right, uh, which is generated by the usual balls, generated by balls in this norm, right, is called, if you need to call it something, you just, you sometimes you call it strong topology, or topology generated by the norm. Okay, well if you don't say anything, it's usually implicit that you're talking about the, this usual topology. Okay. Uh, So this, the dual space, is the space of linear functions, linear functionals né, from E to R, that are continuous with respect to the, to, the, to the usual norm. So they are continuous in this topology. But I may ask the following question. So the question that motivates the definition of the topology is that question. So what is actually the smallest topology that makes all F in the dual space be continuous. So 
the linear functionals are continuous in the strong topology. So this is okay. You have some open sets. And the pre-image of any open set in the real line is an open set on, the, on E. So these functions, remember, they are mapping your E to R. Being continuous means that if I take an open set here and I bring back F minus 1 of A, this is A, means that the, the pre-image of open sets is sets. So the strong topology has a lot of open sets such that the pre-image of every open set here by F is an open set here. My question is, is it the smallest topology that would make all these maps continuous? I mean, it seems that there is a lot of open sets here. Some of them may not be necessary. So what I want now is to actually, okay, now let me make the smallest topology that would make all of these maps continuous. And we will see that this topology is strictly smaller than the strong topology. So if I want to answer this question, what's the smallest topology that makes all these maps? So I have a collection of maps, I have my functions, and I want to make these functions continuous. So there is a lot of guys that will be open sets. Okay? So what I want is that uh, so we can take the pre-images of, uh, of, uh, of open sets in R by all the maps. This we get some open some sets in E and take the, the topology generated by by these sets. I yeah. That I frame it on the basis. Exactly. Okay, so let's do this. So let me, what's the basic open set here that I have? Uh, intervals, right? So let's say pre-image f to the minus 1 of any interval must be open. Right? For any E contained in R interval, Interval is just the ball, no. and any f in the dual space. So these are the sets that must be open. Okay. So if I start the construction that was here on this board, what's the minimal topology, the smallest topology that contains certain sets? So this will be the sets, say, a lambda, collection a lambda, something like this. Okay. So by definition, this is the definition. The weak topology that we're going to define in this space is the smallest topology that makes all of these maps continuous. Okay, so this is the definition. The weak topology. On E. Sometimes referred to S, sigma, sigma is another letter used for the part. So sigma E made by the maps of E star. So it's the smallest topology on E such that all the maps in, in E star are continuous. Uh, is the smallest topology that makes all F belonging to E star to be continuous. Okay. Now, so as I said before, right? So for any F, F minus 1 of any open set on R has to be open has to be an open set in this topology. Okay, so the pre-image of any open set by any map has to be open by all of these maps. And uh, finite intersections and arbitrary units. So I claim to you, so this must be open, but I claim to you that I can get only, say, 
say intervals. Uh, let's just start maybe easier. So we'll say a lambda, I'll just set, say f minus 1 of a, where any a contained in R open, uh, and uh, any f star. And my topology I generate phi is just an arbitrary finite intersection of a lambdas. And my topology sigma is just arbitrary unions of finite intersections. Okay, good. So these are my sets that need to be open, the pre-image of any open set in R by any map, by any of these maps that I'm giving to you. And I, I baptize the sets to be my A lambda. These are open sets by definition. Any finite intersections of them are open. Any arbitrary union of finite intersections have to be open as well. So, and this is, as we have seen, well, as I left you as an exercise, this is enough to construct a topology. This is a topology. OK. Are we good? So we have defined what it is, a topology. Now let's understand a little bit better. I want to actually clarify what would be a basis for this topology. Go ahead. Uh, if we change just the, like, the star, we also have, I mean, if we take a sub-collection of the functions, we also have a corresponding weak topologies, but in this case, uh, the functions for, with this topology would be the, the functions that we started with? Yes. They don't uh, include? Yes. You can, yeah. You can start with any collection of functions that you want to make continuous, and define the smallest topology that makes all of those functions that you chose to be continuous continuous. Yeah, but, but it could be that by making this continuous, we also make other functions continuous. It could be, but it need not be. It need not be, but it okay. could be. OK? This depends. This will depend on the application that you have in mind and the situation that you have in mind. Okay. Good. Now let's see. So my claim is that just if I take pre-images of intervals, there should be enough to generate a basis of these things. So let's see. What do I want to show? Uh, so Claim, given, say, x0 belonging to E and f1, f2, fk elements in dual and, say, an epsilon belonging to 0, epsilon bigger than 0, I will construct, I will construct this neighborhood, let's say, V, which will depend on say x0 and f1, f2, fk, and epsilon, of course, which is just going to be the set of points x that belongs to, to E, such that, say, fi, let's write it like this, acting x minus x0, if you want, and uh, oh, this is less than epsilon for i plus 1, 2, OK. OK, so recall the notation here. So the notation that we use sometimes is uh, f of x. So functional applied to a point in x is the same as say, f acting on x. OK, so sometimes some books will use f of x. Some other books will use the pairing f acting on x. It's just, uh, this is slightly more convenient for the discussion that will follow this, which is when we define the weak star topology on the dual. <coughs> okay. So, so in other words, this is the, the, the set of x such that fi of x minus fi of x0 is less than epsilon. Okay, this is the set of x such that fi of x belongs 
to the interval, say, fi of x0 minus epsilon, fi of x0 plus epsilon. Okay, so this, this neighborhood is the set of x in the space E, such that this condition here holds for all k's, all i's from 1 to k. Okay? So one condition of this means that x belongs, f i of x belongs to this interval. So x belongs to the pre-image of this interval. All right? So in fact, one condition is a pre-image of an open set. So this is just this is just a finite intersection of some of these open sets, right? So this is just a finite intersection of k pre-images of open sets. So by definition, this set here, V, this neighborhood here is an open set in the weak topology. Okay? So let me just write this down. So note, since note that V is just the intersection from i1 to k of fi to the minus 1 of the interval fi of x0 minus epsilon and fi of x0 plus epsilon. Okay, so this is an intersection of k open sets. This has to be open. So this is, this is open in, in the support. Good. Well, I forgot my claim, right? The claim was that these neighborhoods are a basis, okay? Are a basis for the topology. Good. I'm proving that they are actually part of the, the topology. Now, why are they a basis? Why? Why does any neighborhood like this contain some neighborhood like this. Because if we have a neighborhood in this uh, topology, then we know that it is generated by unions or finite intersections with things which are pre images. So these pre images can be considered as union of pre images of uh, integral. So if I take a point, I take its image, um, this, Im this, this image will be a point in, the, in, our, in our open field. So we can, I can find a small enough epsilon such that uh, such an interval is in my uh, open field. Therefore, the inverse image, the inverse image will be, will be, will, will be here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the intersection. Uh, but because by by, I want, uh, by, uh, by definition, uh, I am thinking all the all the functions will be continuous. This must be continuous. Uh, this must be sorry. Open. Yeah, you got the idea, right? I mean, this is just uh, almost a restatement of the definition, right? So so I define these neighborhoods. I'm actually showing that they are open sets. They belong to the topology. Now take so now take. Uh, any, any set, say, W belonging to your topology and any x0 in W. Of course, this, this f1, fk vary, epsilon varies, and x0 varies as well over all the points, right? So if you take any W and any x0 in W, so this means W is, is one sort of arbitrary union of, of, of some, say, finite intersection of things. So if x0 belongs to w, belongs to an arbitrary union, it will have to belong to some of some one of these guys. So your x0 belongs to a finite intersection of these guys. Right? So now these guys as we define were just pre-images of open sets. So x0 belonging to the finite intersection of a lambda means that f i of x0, which is a finite intersection from 1 to k, so there are k functions already. So if i of x0 belongs to each of these open sets A, but these are open sets on R, so around f i of x0 you can just put a small interval of say epsilon. Now make epsilon work for all the k guys and, and construct that open set, that open set will be inside here. Okay, this is just uh, think about it 
and, uh, and, and, and show that this neighborhood V of, say, x0, f1, some k, and some epsilon is contained in W, or some small epsilon. Did you get it? OK. This is important. So in, in, in some sense, we could just take pre-images of intervals, if you want. Pre-images of intervals is all that we need. Pre-images of little balls on R. So finite intersections of this would be essentially these guys, finite intersection of these things. I'm sorry? Why are we taking finite intersections? This. As opposed to what? What would you like to take if not finite intersections? Just take each one separately. But this would not form a basis of the topology. We want the basis, not the sub-basis? Uh, let's see. Let's see. If, if you had just one, if you had just one, okay? Uh, If you just say, if you, if you just vary x0 and take one function, right? So you're allowed to vary x0 and one function, and you would like to show that every, every... My question, uh, what I would like to say is, if we do not take finite intersections and assume that these are in the topology, the topology that contains these sets would be the same topology. And this is correct. The topology that contains, if you don't take finite intersections here, if you just take uh, points and functions, the topology that contains all of these open sets, the pre-images, will be, will be this topology. That's correct. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning, I'm seeing if it, this is still a basis in the sense that we define, that every open set in topology, and for every open set and every point, this will contain a little neighborhood of this form. It will not be a general because if I take a, a pre-image of two different uh, uh, functions, I get a two open sets, their intersection is an open set, yes. but not necessarily this, or, uh, there is a, a pre-image of one of them is contained in this, not necessarily two. So let's see, let's see what you want to make. I don't want to erase here the definition, because this is what we need. So let's see. So the question that you ask is, is that if the sets, uh, do the sets, no, see, if these sets of the form V of say X0 <coughs> and F and say Epsilon, which is just the set of X in E such that say F pairing of X minus X0 less than Epsilon. If such sets, they form a basis. Uh, also, there's this. No, no, I, I, don't, I didn't claim that this forms a basis. This, this sets, they generate the topology. They so one thing is to generate the, the, generate, one thing is to generate the same topology. Uh, I, mean, I meant, what's the significance of considering this subset with finite intersection, intersections, not choosing this one? Because, you know, some, not one of them. I, I want to draw your attention for this, I, I, I want to form a basis of the topology, because whenever I, whenever I say, take an open set in the weak topology V and a point x0. So you will know that when I say this, take an open set and a point x0, you will know that there will be a smaller open set here that contains x0 that is of this form, as opposed to V must be very wired. So you can always restrict your arguments to sets of, say, this form. So you may always assume that your open set that contains x0 is of this form. But, but let's think about a little bit if, if sets of this form, if just one function, would be enough to form a basis. What would be a counterexample, like you were trying to say? If I take two different functions? With the same point? Um. So yeah, that's the yeah, with the same point. Okay, so let's just try to see. 
let's just try to see if I could get the same, yeah, if I could get two functions, say f1 and f2. Uh, yeah, if, if I just took a neighborhood like this with two functions, f1 and f2, why would it have to, there would be a, 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 another function? So if the neighborhood, if I took this neighborhood v of say x0, f1, f2, and a little epsilon, as being just the intersection of, of two of these. So, yeah, so this is just v of x0, f1, and epsilon, intersection v of x0, f2, and epsilon in your notation. Okay, if I just take the intersection of these two open sets, this is an open set. And the question is why, why there exists, say, a new f and a new epsilon zero such that these guys would be contained here. Uh, is that obvious that it doesn't exist, or that it does exist, or it may not exist? We have to think about it. Did exist one. It's not obvious that there exists one. Yeah, we'd have to think about it because these are two functions, two functions, two different functions, right? So you're taking, say, you're taking a neighbor, a pre-image of, of, of one ball here. So you're taking this guy. So x zero is in the two of them. Right, this is your set, and you would like it to, to show that there exists another function of f in another epsilon, epsilon zero such that uh, these guys were inside here. Uh, well, yeah. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just have to think about it. Maybe it's true, but uh, but from the definition that we posed on the board, this was the obvious choice. I mean, that follows from our definition of the weakest topology, that these are bases. Well, I think, I think we have to give explicit, explicit f1 and f2, which admits, uh, for which we cannot do this. Yes, I think if, if in some, maybe in some space you find a specific f1 and f2 such that there is no f of this sort. But I would have to think about more to construct this counterexample. But maybe think about it. It might be a good exercise. Don't know how to solve, and then you know it goes on the homework exercise. Think about it. Okay. Okay. discuss in the next class. I think always, if these functionals are linearly independent, it will always be not true, I think. Oh, if they are linearly independent, it will always not be true. Let me think about a little bit, and then let's think together, and then we'll continue. Let's stop for today, and we we'll continue next Thursday, OK? So Thursday at 2, we we'll continue this discussion with topologies. Uh, Okay, that should be enough for today, guys. Let's turn off the camera.